It is such a pleasure to be here with you today and to speak to you about something close to me personally that is about machines. This is the Guest, Ghost, Host, Machine podcast from Serpentine Galleries. In this series, artists of all disciplines transport us through time, space, and legend in a quest to understand the ghost in the machine, but often end up leaving us with more questions than answers. My name is Legacy Russell, and we're back again with Victoria Sin for episode three. You can subscribe to the entire series on Apple Podcasts. Just type in guest, ghost, host, machine. I'm pretty sure we'll be the only one with that name. Most certainly. You will have noticed that there's a funny robotic voice that opens each episode of this series. That's actually an extract from a kinetic sculpture made by artist and writer Dean Kenning, which was also part of the Serpentine Marathon. In this case, it was a fan um, with a face, and typically I don't face my fans in that (laughs) way, unless it's very hot. Um, So it was actually kind of a humorous piece, I would say. Um, Definitely kept me chuckling. You were running around, though, so you might not have gotten a chance to come face to face with the fan. I did not come face to face with the face on the fan, but uh, (laughs) it does sound very silly. Say that 10 times over (laughs) and 10 times fast. Um, But yeah, it had a disembodied robotic voice coming out. The movement of the fan created a very cool audio effect. Um, Certainly, I think our audience members who were close by got a, a good look at it and definitely a good chuckle. Are you alive? Or are you dead? Or are you something else altogether? Something more like a machine? Today's ghost and guest are Ian Chang and Richard Evans. Richard Evans is a research scientist at DeepMind, part of a team that focuses on machine learning, artificial intelligence, and neuroscience. He worked on the latest version of The Sims to improve their simulations of social interaction. Victoria, do you remember playing The Sims? I do. I used to play it all the time. It's it was pretty one sick, the, yeah. One of the only <laughs> games that I had on my computer. I remember actually like becoming quite, you know, taking up this kind of god role and, and becoming quite cruel and playing all these like weird social experiments on them. It was kind of dark. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it is in, kind of amazing when you start playing these games that you can kind of um, get really quickly sucked into playing God. Mm. Um, I do think there is a human instinct in there to like have all control. It gives you a sense of uh, maybe feeling empowered, but also, of course, the implications of that, given our ongoing conversations about AI and robotics, definitely um, can be quite chilling. Ian Chang is an artist who has developed live simulations, living virtual ecosystems that begin with basic programmed properties, but are left to self-evolve independently of their creator. So in this talk, Chang and Evans are discussing social contexts and teaching AI to recognize these. Here are Ian Chang and Richard Evans in conversation. The first voice you'll hear is Ian's. I'm a huge fan of Richard's work, and I came across it through several papers online because I was obviously a fan of The Sims 3, uh, a fan of black and white, and I came across a very special paper of Richard's to do with a story engine called Versu, which was a way to simulate social interaction um, with a group of agents. Uh, and if you know and played video games, um, social agents are very rare in the world of video games. Normally you're shooting at something or you're trying to build something or you're trying to destroy something. Um, but sociality is something that's very difficult to model, something that we are all experts at. And so that's very hard to make it feel right in the context of a game, in the context of a simulation. I um, wanted to maybe just talk a little bit about this engine called Versu and how you uh, went about modeling what you called social practices. Yes, so first of all, I'd just like to motivate why I think these social practices are so important to model. It was, it was when I was first seeing the original Sims game, which was at the time a, a hugely impressive game and it still is. And 
I, I was like, wow, there are these little magical people and they're walking around and they're interacting with each other and this is all great. And then my sim, and he'd invited this other sim to come round to his house. And, it, and the other sim, the visiting sim, came and rang on the doorbell and went ding dong. And my sim answered the doorbell and I was like, wow, this is magical. And then after they'd spoken for a few minutes, my sim went off and he went upstairs and he went and he had a bath. And I was like, well, ah, oh, this, is, this was the moment for me where I was like, ah, oh, this, is, this is not yet full AI, right? The, you, because we all know that if, if, um, if you invite someone over to your house, you don't just walk off and have a bath. But this is, this is a violation of a subtle, subtle social norm. So it wasn't like there was just some bug in the software. It wasn't like, oh, you know, they put a plus plus when they should have put a minus minus, right? This was a deep lack of understanding of, of what the norms are of social practices, right? So the, the norm that the, the agents didn't understand is that if you invite someone over, you need to look after them. You need to pay attention to them. You, you can't just walk off and have a bath. And so I thought, well, what, did, what would it take to actually model the myriad of social practices that we're in all the time? Right? What, what would be a computational model of practices? And, and that was really the driving force behind this system. It seems to me that we're in all these practices all the time, and what we need is a computational model of them so the agents can understand them, so they won't go off and have a bath when they've invited someone around. And you distinguish between something I think very uh, fundamental and beautiful, which is that um, often when we think of an agent or uh, an AI in the context of a video game, uh, we're using and thinking of them as having a, you call it a regulative uh, view of their agency, which is uh, you're an agent and you just have a certain set of goals and no matter what situation you're in, you're gonna maximize those goals, you're gonna achieve some value based on some reward, and it doesn't matter what context it in, is in, therefore, like if you had the goal of really taking a bath, you would do it in the context of a party. But then you've developed what you call the constitutive view of agency, which is that we could be doing a million possible things right now, um, but we, we don't. You and I are speaking on this mic in front of you guys, you guys are watching, and this is a kind of social practice, and we're limited in a way to this set of things, uh, but within that, it acknowledges that context actually does matter as a part of intelligence, and this is something that I think you really got at the heart of in terms of modeling it in a computer system. Yeah, that's right, exactly. That was my focus. So, so right now, as, exactly as you say correctly, there's an infinite number of actions that we can do. I could enumerate all the prime numbers. I could ring up my wife and say, Wibble. There's an infinite number of possible actions I could do. But almost all of them don't even dawn on me right now, right? It's, it's like somehow from this infinity of possible actions I can do, we're just focused on this small, finite set. Now, that's a huge achievement, but that's an achievement that goes unnoticed in most AI systems, because they assume in advance that restriction. And it, it was exactly, it was, what are these units that provide these collections of affordances? And the argument is, it's a social practice. A social practice is a collection of affordances. And so that's how we have a finite number of things that we think about doing, because we're in a finite number of practices at any moment. And it seems to me that the limited affordances is actually a kind of freedom because it actually makes things meaningful. You know, I think of this Philip K. Dick thing where he said that he goes about writing his novels by changing one small thing in reality, like maybe you make gravity just 50%. And then the, the task of a sci-fi author is to then imagine all the different uh, ways in which life culture would change based on this one tweak. And in a way, the best sci-fi authors pre-imagine all the social uh, practice consequences. And I gather that if we had AI with more and more of this ability to respond to context within the uh, knowledge of having an accumulation of social context, tweaking one thing, you could get something quite artistic and beautiful. Is that Yeah, that's exactly that right. I, I think that, yeah, exactly. I think that's a, a great thought. So what I find personally fascinating about things like science fiction novels is not the fact that they've got spaceships and aliens and stuff, but it's the fact that there's a different set of practices on this world. And so what we really want from our computer agents is the ability to construct entirely new practices. So, so in our world, when we eat, eating is a, a social thing that we all do together. And going to the toilet, whatever, is something we do on our own. But you could imagine it's something which was swapped around. So eating is something that, that we don't do with other people. We just, it's some shameful thing we do on our own in the, in the privacy of our own kitchens. The, the set of possible social practices is infinite. Like, it could be that we could, um, we could, for example, on the full moon, we could sacrifice all our cheese to make a giant cheese toasty, and then we could um, sacrifice it and not eat it. But then the highest status people are the ones that sacrifice the most cheese. There's an infinite number of practices that we can invent. And what we really want is computational agents inventing their own new practices. And, and then we're seeing an infinite number of possible worlds. Not possible worlds in the sense of physically different worlds, but as socially different worlds. 
It's very interesting because you also said something to me backstage, which is that if I just chose to do something extremely random right now, like, <laughs> like that in itself is constrained in a way by a, a hidden, perhaps to myself, social practice. Yes. I wanted to make a disruptive point. <laughs> And, but this randomness, in order for it to mean something for yeah. you and for me, for right. me, the idea of me doing it, has to come from its own accumulated set of social practices that I'm bringing to this social practice. It's, a social practice interrupts a social practice, but to do something in a total vacuum yes. is to kind of not be alive. Yeah, exactly, or, or for it not to mean anything. It's, like, it's just physical flailing. If, it, if it's going to mean anything, it has to be inside these contexts. So what we want to do as AI researchers is model these contexts formally. Exactly, that's right. Um, I'm curious now, um, um, so the way in which you've modeled social practices have been more toward the, the angle of, uh, or it's been implemented in a, in using symbolic logic. Yeah. Um, but the uh, orthodoxy of today in terms of AI is machine learning, deep learning. Um, how do you see those things ever coming together? Do they replace one another? Does one replace the other? Is, a, is deep learning forever a thing? Or is there a kind of middle ground? Yeah, that's a really good question. So deep learning is certainly hugely impressive at a large number of perceptual tasks. And, and symbolic, um, old school symbolic computing is also good at a number of different tasks. So for example, long range planning, if you want to plan over multiple steps. Uh, theorem proving. There are lots of things that um, symbolic systems are extremely good at. And there are a lot of things that um, neural networks are very, very good at, in including pattern uh, recognition. And what we really want, exactly as you say, is, is a unified system that has the best of both these worlds, that's both symbolic and crisp, but also fuzzy and neural and tolerant to noise and robust to error. What we really want is a unification of those things. I mean, that to some extent is the holy grail of AI. If we really could have unification of those things, then we could all go home and have a big holiday. But there is something historical which I'd like to draw your attention to as a sort of analogy. So in the 18th century, there were two types of, uh, two major schools of philosophy. One was the empiricists and one was the rationalists. So the empiricists, British empiricists, people like Locke and Berkeley and Hume, and they were effectively the old school philosophy version of the deep learning guys. They were all about, oh, we start with nothing and we learn, we learn a model of the world. And then oh, opposed to them were the rationalists, mostly... Um, German, and they came from a very different view, which is that we impose a lot of logical structure, and it's only because we impose that structure that we're able to make sense of the world. And so you have these two competing schools of philosophy, which in many ways are exactly the same as the two competing types of AI we've got now, right? The, the deep learning people and symbolic people. And then Immanuel Kant did this hugely impressive synthesis of uh, empiricism and rationalism. And my hope is there's, there's going to be some sort of parallel unification in, in, in AI, where we can combine the power of neural networks with the power of symbolic logical reasoning. Um, and lastly, I just want to ask, I hear you have children. How do your children influence your work in AI? Because it strikes me that I learn the most about my own work and my own like, interest in AI through my dog. And I can only imagine a children, which is a self-learning, unsupervised learner huh? through and through, is and one who's learning constantly new social practices and breaking them <laughs> and inventing their own um, might be, I'm curious if it's a source of inspiration or a source of torment or um, how are the kids? <laughs> well, it, largely it's a source of humility because they, they learn so much so quickly and it, it makes you realize how many difficult challenges there are to implement, to do the sort of thing that a, someone can do by the time they're two and a half is, is quite remarkable. So it really is a source of humility and they're also kind of cute. Um, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. So it's really interesting to think about this kind of idea of an accumulation of social contexts and this interesting thing of science fiction being not the aliens or the machines, but rather being able to be immersed in this different set of affordances, um, different social contexts. Ian mentions Philip K. Dick and this strategy of, of kind of just changing one thing and seeing what happens in society as a result of this and, and what this would feel like. And I think this is also a strategy that a lot of kind of social science fiction authors use to imagine different futures, kind of thinking towards better social contexts and, 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 and what they would look like, how we would build them. 
Ian Chang will be having a solo show at the Serpentine in spring 2018. For more information, visit serpentinegalleries.org. You've been listening to the Guest, Ghost, Host, Machine podcast from Serpentine Galleries. All of the material in this series was originally recorded at or produced for the Serpentine Marathon in October 2017. You can subscribe to get new episodes on Apple Podcasts or listen on Serpentine Radio at radio.serpentinegalleries.org. Our music is by marathon performer Fatima Al-Qadiri, a.k.a. Aishai. Dominating devices and spectacles. Guest ghost. Host machine.